There's people out there that want to broadcast music which is not being catered for by wider mainstream broadcasters. It was called pirate radio because there's a bunch of guys on ships breaking the law in international waters. They've turned the tops of London Tower blocks into fortresses. I always kind of had the understanding that it was illegal. And if you love music, you'd always take that risk. Pirates? Yes. Criminals? No. We broke a lot of boundaries. I don't think, oh, I'm up to something bad. I'm just a radio DJ. Oh, it's a I think the internet has killed pirate radio, and I don't think it can come back from it. So the thing about pirate radio in London is it's, it's kind of everywhere, it's hidden in plain sight. If you turn on the radio, you tune the dial left to right, you'll, you'll find a station, but if you look around you're not going to see them, and they're literally all over the place. They're in residential neighbourhoods, big tower blocks like the ones behind us. There are pirates transmitting about 80 stations across the city, still exist today. Pirate radio is something that was born of necessity. Whatever it was over the years, whether it was you know, rock and roll in the 60s, you know, whether in the 80s it was Acid House, 90s you had Jungle and Garage, you know, to the turn of the century and you had you know, grime music. It was literally people that lived and loved that music, playing it for nothing more than the enjoyment of it. We needed a platform to get our music out there. The easiest way is if you want something done, you do it yourself, because in them days they weren't playing none of this sort of music. People there realise that this jungle music, what no one wanted to play or be associated with, all of a sudden was breaking down barriers and boundaries, which they hadn't seen before. So this is a typical inner city tower block. You'll find pirate stations transmitting from places like this all over London. The reason so many pirates are in these buildings is because the roofs are pretty easy to access. It's much easier to get up on one of these than it is to get on an office block. Pirates will get onto the top of these roofs no matter what. They've got skeleton keys, they can get through any door that they put up. If you're up here once a week, I mean, this is a dangerous place to be. It's the very, very tops of the buildings like this where you're going to find... You're going to find a pirate antenna. Wow. <laughs> and it looks like we got lucky. <laughs> wow, this is a gold mine. Okay. Uh, so this is exactly what we're looking for. This is kind of how prior antennas look, put together by hand. There's two leads coming out of this. One's going to the transmitter, um, which we spoke to the caretaker about, and he actually thinks thinks it's down in here somewhere, and then and they can't get it out. And I guess maybe that's that's the lift shaft or something, but somehow that's going down to an infrared link that's pointing somewhere over this direction. So somewhere out here in sort of two mile radius is a pirate radio studio using this antenna to broadcast to this entire area. It's really smart they do it because no one can ever find you. If you're, you're from Ofcom and you come up here and you find this, you can take this down. But I mean, look out here. I mean, the pirates could be anywhere, literally a needle in a haystack. The way that most pirate stations rig up their studios, they tune a radio in the studio into their own signal. So they're listening to their whole signal on a feedback loop. The reason they do that is because if Ofcom come up here and they, they cut this wire, then the air's just gonna go dead. And it's when you're in the studio and suddenly you hear just stack across the speakers, that's when you know that Ofcom have found your antenna and they're somewhere on a roof looking around, trying to figure out where you are. And that's your cue as a DJ in the station to pack up your records and leave uh, as quick as you can. These people actually climb up the side of the blocks of flats and quite clearly they could fall to their deaths. It was like, we're gonna do this. We get the money together, we buy a transmitter, we sling it up and we're not frightened, you know, we're not gonna be, oh, police are gonna catch us and lock us up. We do what we gotta do. I don't think, yeah, I'm a pirate. I'm just a radio DJ. I already thought about it today now, because you're saying it. Now I feel like I'm doing something wrong, but I'm not. That was a way to get your music out, that was a way to get your music heard. And if you love music, you'd always take that risk. Okay, so we're in a car park in southwest London. We're about to go to the Flex FM studio. We can't be shown the location of it, so they're going to blindfold us. But this means we'll be able to get inside and see how it all works. All right, I'm ready. I like that. Let's go. Let's go, man. This way? <laughs> get in there. <laughs> I've got a 
gotta say, I'm, I'm jealous. This is this is better than any pirate station I ever played on. Like in terms of the sound you got, it's uh, it's pretty nuts. Like, t- tell us about it. So this is all soundproof. Yeah, yeah. Basically, seven-inch walls, a security gate. It's got two bolts which are basically bolted through the brickwork. And the gate has to be locked at all times. It can only be open from the inside yeah. as well. So, so what goes on in here? Basically, it's like the heart of everything. It's pretty simple. Keep it low budget. Um, Low budget. Yeah. Oh my God. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> For a pirate, this isn't like. Yeah, it's low budget because it's not, it's not all brand new expensive equipment. So yeah. So basically, <laughs> this is where you can, we control everything from. Right. You've got the amp there, which is wired over the top into the studio. That then goes into a software program, which basically streams it to the internet. We bounce that around the world to basically disguise the location yeah. where we're coming from. Dan is now taking us to where Flex FM transmit from. This is highly illegal. If he's caught, he could go to prison. The studio and transmitter are never in the same place. They're connected via an infrared signal, which is completely untraceable. A pirate radio station that wants to stay around for more than a few weeks has to have backup transmitters in the studio if they get hit by Ofcom. Dan showed us some of the rigs that he's got set up and ready to go if this one gets taken down. So that gets in all the books. Good. Um, CCTV's off, so I don't know. Yeah, it's up there. So where are we, where are we going then? We're going to our transmission site. Uh, we're actually in the process of moving at the moment, so that's why we're bringing you there, basically. So let's do it. Quick, quick, quick. Ready. Shoot. Right. This let's is go. Where, this is where our actual aerial is. It's a twin stack. So everything feeds straight down the edge here. The rig is actually down the side of the block on it in a safe. Yeah. And uh, uh, listen, let's that's go, us let's really. Go, let's go. Let's cut. Let's cut. But in the day, don't want nothing negative to come out of it. So just positive. Actions, we're not. We're not actually causing anybody any harm. Just putting up an aerial and playing some music at the end of the day. That is it. The story of Pirate Radio starts in the English Channel on real life pirate ships and abandoned sea forts that were transformed into radio stations back in the 50s and 60s when commercial radio was illegal in Europe. Pirate DJs took to the seas, broadcasting rock and roll to millions of people in the UK and around the world. We set out to see where the story began. The Mournsall forts were built during World War II and dropped into the ocean. Originally there were gun platforms, used to shoot down the Luftwaffe as they flew overhead to bomb London. The army decommissioned them in the 50s thinking they would rust and fall into the sea, but they didn't and pirates took them over. Few pirates in London today know the story of the sea forts. They're a long forgotten myth, but the pirates on the sea forts were real. We found two of them who agreed to take us out to Red Sands, a fort several miles out to sea that few people get to explore. The original pirates. And did you grow up down here? Yes, it's my back garden. Yeah. We considered that it was a people's right to have a radio station of their own, not run by governments. It was slightly illegal to do it ashore. It essentially had to be out beyond the three mile coastal yes. limit. We were giving the people something that they'd never had before. Free, popular music. Groups were getting out and heard that you would never have heard of otherwise. Yeah. Up you go. Okay. Right. To begin with, it was bitterly cold. The first year out here was bitterly cold. 
you can imagine trying to offload equipment and food and stores and diesel off here on, in a gale, it's no joke. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard. Thank you. <laughs> through, the, through the door. This is insane. And we were, at the time, outside the limit, therefore we have to protect ourselves. Yeah, yeah, you're in international everything. waters, right? Yeah. We were well armed. Flamethrowers, grenades, we had shotguns, we had everything. Oh my God, this is it's huge. Mind the steps, hang on to the rail. Wow, this is, the and this is the roof. Gun deck. The signal level from this particular fort was way in advance of the, the BBC at the time. Was there anyone ever like injured? The only injury we ever had was one appendicitis, which we had to get ashore quickly. That was the only accident we ever had, apart from, of course, the death of the uh, DJs and the engineer and the skipper of the boat that what? disappeared somewhere between here and going ashore. It sank. The engineer, we never did find him. And strangely enough, the DJ turned up somewhere in Spain. The only way they knew was because he had a tape in his pocket uh, from here of that particular night. Uh, so what happened to that boat, we don't know. How did you communicate with you? Our mail. Yeah. Mail from a far away. It's India. What? Right? And that's how we knew we, we had four million, six million, eight million audience. Did you ever get groupies out here? I mean, how did that work? Oh, yes. <laughs> we had them out in boats. And Seriously? Shifts and semi-clad ladies. Sometimes they'd get here and get stranded. We'd have to look after them. And then their mothers would want to know where they were. And, oh. <laughs> and we'd have to get them back somehow. So that's what kept you in business, <laughs> right? That's what kept you doing it. It's all coming out now. <laughs> so you guys, you're still broadcasting from up here today, right? Yeah, once a year. And are you using the internet as well? Are you online? Yes. We stream. Online. Worldwide. The pirates in London are all doing that now. Absolutely. We taught them how to do it. We're the best in the you business. You did. You are. <laughs> best in the business. And we still are. It was amazing being out in the forts meeting Tony and Robin. I got the sense that they got involved in pirate radio for the same reason I did. They see it as a sense of community service. The forts are where pirate radio started. Where it went after that was in the city London. But talking to the pirates broadcasting today, it's clear things are changing. It was a big community, it was like a community thing and there was loads of people, not just DJs, people that made music on the station and we'd all play each other's tracks and it opened my eyes to a whole new sound that was coming through at the time. I got into Rinse at a really exciting time when, when guys like Wiley were just starting to make those beats that he's legendary for. Rinse always know what's popping. Like, you know, all these names like Wiley, Kano, Dizzy, that like, all come from Rinse, innit? Pirate Radio definitely aided my, my career in this thing. I definitely needed it. If you was on Pirate Radio Station, that you're something. By coming to the radio and being heard, then they get a following, then the big labels want them. They have to have us there. Like, if we, wasn't, if we stopped playing music, they'd be like, ah, oh, where would they get the new thing from? They wouldn't know where to look. They have turned Ritz FM, the pirate station, into Ritz.FM, the brand. They have events, they have a record label. 16 years on the radio, I think that just deserves a license, don't you think? Is there a nostalgia for FM? That's like the root of pirate, in a way. I see what you're saying, like, all trying to get fuzz and trying to hear the station, but why? I can listen to rinse on my Blackberry. I don't need, like, FM. The internet adds extra layers to the experience. You've got a whole new generation that will embrace that pirate spirit in a new way, you know, based on the technology at hand. When we were coming up, it was like, you had to get on the radio or you're not getting hurt. But now, you can literally just have, you've got MySpace, Facebook. You can upload your stuff, send it out, anyone in the world can hear it. That's what the internet's given us. It's given everyone pirate radio. We move where we got to move. That's it. You know, we'll always be there. It's sad to think the pirate stations I grew up playing on might not survive the next decade. Maybe we're losing something special, or maybe the platforms are just changing again. 
One thing is clear, the spirit of Pirate Radio lives on. The internet is creating endless opportunities for pirate DJs, artists and music lovers alike. It feels like the end of an era, but a new one is just beginning. Yeah. <laughs>